Forum Borealis Paradigm Expansion Greetings from the North. To the citizens of the world, welcome to the Forum. Dr. Joseph Farrell is back to set the record straight regarding education. This program is a compilation of several separate chats we've had with him regarding this topic. In other words, it consists of different recordings from throughout 2016, despite the uniform fusion of them that makes it appear as one. So the most perceptive of you will notice, but now without confusion, that incidental datings passed on during the chat do not match each other. Our subject matter is perfect for our guest as he is a former professor, having worked as instructor for many years in several American states. With his patristics degree from Oxford University, he masters interdisciplinary matters, not only because this degree requires knowledge of language, history, philosophy, etc., but also because uh, he's had a lifelong passion for different subjects that he has attained a skilled level in from World War II to deep physics. Indeed, as a prolific author, he's published more than 36 books on various controversial and exotic themes and is a respected documents researcher diving into all sorts of primary sources with an incredible ability to perceive new angles in old expositions and connect seemingly disparate dots. Joseph is also a classical composer and performer and a lifelong organist. One of the factors to why it's exciting listening to him speak, apart from his profound knowledge, is that he is not afraid to speculate, but as a good scholar makes it clear when he does. For more details, check our presentation of him at our website, where you will find his full bibliography, or visit his own site, an online academy of sorts called Giza Death Star, after one of his early books on the antediluvian civilization. Today's conversation is based upon the book by him and his colleague Gary Lawrence called Rotten to the Common Core. Hello. There he is. Yes. Howdy, howdy. <laughs> so we start with the education thing then. Mm -hmm. And um, I have a question to you regarding your new book. Because you seem to be going out of your usual element here. Not that mm -hmm. uh, I'm suggesting this. Uh, I mean, this is your field. You are a professor after all. So it's a very timely book. But uh, it's still a little fresh, uh, or I should probably avoid that word in American. <laughs> but, but it's, <laughs> it's an innovative uh, step for you now, uh, considering what you've done so far. Mm -hmm. You mean you're talking about the book uh, Rotten to the Common Core? Yes, uh, regarding education. Regarding American education, or really the lack thereof. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that you've been talking with George Ann many times. Uh, oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah, we talked about that. Um, actually, it is just now today out on Kindle, uh, the hard copy of that book. I don't know why they did it this way, because I told them not to do it this way. Release the hard copy and let Kindle just die, please. Um, yeah, it's a normal order of it, isn't it? Yeah, I'm afraid so. First the hardcover and then the softcover and then the digital. Yeah, but they, they reversed it. And <laughs> uh, the, the hard copy 
should be out in August. And I do beg people, please get hard copies. Don't trust these eBooks. They're not formatted properly. You cannot fact or page cite properly. And another thing, your target group yeah. for that particular book would be more prone to reading physical books. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it is about education anyway. Well, it's not just about education. People ask me, what's that book doing and with the rest of your books? And I can assure you there's a relationship, but you just have to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The book may seem like it is out of the normal flow of my books, but when you read it, I think you'll discover it really isn't. Uh, in particular, in the book, I, I go into the findings of the Reese Committee, which is one of those congressional committees that was created by the Congress in the post-World War II era to investigate external influences and penetrations on the American government. Mm. And it's one of those committees that I've been advocating or urging that people – put into the context of all of these congressional investigations, you know, of mafia penetration and communist penetration and so on and so forth. Well, the Reese Committee is kind of for a forgotten committee, but it was investigating the influence of corporate foundations on education and American culture. And again, you find the same players. Hmm. So I'm I'm approaching I approach that book deliberately from the standpoint that people need to to put that in the context of the rest of the book. So it seems at first glance like it's totally out of the picture from everything else I've been doing. Mm. But it actually stands four square in the whole series of books. Absolutely. Hmm. You have a co authors this time, I saw. Yeah, I have a co-author. Uh, Gary Lawrence is the co-author. It's misprinted on the Amazon uh, cover, but I do have a co-author. I have a number of friends that are still in the teaching profession in this country, and they've been telling me horror stories of, of what's going on in terms of this so-called Common Core program, yeah. which is the latest educational fad to hit this country. But um, it may seem like it's not a topic very worthy of attention by a European audience, but uh, I would I would urge people not to look at it that way because I oh no 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 it's a blueprint for what's coming here oh yeah so exactly we ought to exactly. check it out yeah, yeah. exactly um, it's it's a horrible thing and and I think once people get into it and see what is actually in the book, they'll see the connections with everything else that, that I've been talking about. What was this implemented during Obama? Uh, actually, the, the, the start really began back under President Bush, but even more so, uh, it, it goes all the way back to planning for education that was done in the 1950s. Wow. Uh, and again, you've got the same group of people that are involved in all of this. Uh, so the connections are there. I, I urge people, you know, don't dismiss it simply because it seems to be on kind of a ho-hum, less sensational topic. It's, it's quite important. Okay. Well, I figured since you've been in the system and you've been uh, concerned about the topic uh, that it was a natural step, but uh, you actually tie it into what you already have written about. shouldn't be surprising because uh, the educational system is just like the media. is one of the tools yep. that if you want to control, if you're Donna Coop and you want to control uh, the narrative, uh, you, yep. you must brainwash the population. Yep. And, and dumb them down. So, yep. But we'll have shows probably where that's more natural to go in depth to. Sure. Now, your new book about the educational system, I have obviously not read it. It's not, it's just for pre-order so far. But do you go into this with the approach that it's actually a, a failure by design? Yes, I do. Uh, I have a co-author, and we we are both convinced that this is by design, and we we go into a little bit of depth about the history of of the American progressive educational movement, and the ultimate inspiration for that, for people that don't know, actually is coming out of Germany. It's coming out of out of the psychological philosophical work of of Wilhelm Wundt. Mm. which is it has had such a, a deleterious effect on American education because essentially 
philosophically, what it does is it reduces people, first of all, to, to a basically materialist philosophy. Mm. Uh, and that means they, they approach the human being, the, the student, as a stimulus response mechanism. And, you know, Pavlov's dogs, essentially. Mm. And this is the way American education has been designed. And even, even around the turn of the century, even the New York Times criticized this whole approach because as far as they were concerned, what it was, would do was it would reduce the American individual to a consumer. And the American system, particularly the educational system, to a system of stimulus, response, and reward. Mm. And in that sort of system, you do not have the requirement for actual learning. And in fact, if you go back and look at the progressive education theorists in this country, around, say, the turn of the century, last century, up until about 1930, mm. uh, and then the really big impetus that it gets after World War II, uh, the problem is, is that you had these educating theorists, philosophers, and so on advocating that it was necessary to get rid of subjects like history, geography, Latin, Greek, the classics. Wow. Uh, you know, in other words, simply gut the traditional academic curriculum. And this yeah, is why. All interesting subjects. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we call it the Norwegian education system. All those are called historic philosophical subjects. Right. And I always thought those were the ones where you had the best room for for independent thought. Yeah, exactly. And and what this is precisely what it's done. It's it's made the general American population basically, if I can put it bluntly, uh, a culture of boobs. It, it's made <laughs> it's created an idiocracy where people are just plain stupid. Yeah. Uh, to tell you how bad it is, I remember once when I was a professor. I, I saw when I was a college professor, Al, too many kids in my class. Now, let me give you an example of how bad it was. Mm. I used to give nothing but essay examinations. I gave all essay tests. And of course, you know, I graded on grammar, spelling and everything else. And they hated that because they actually had to think rather than regurgitate pre-selected answers. In other words, you had to write your answers. You had to write grammatically correct sentences. You had to spell words correctly. You had to argue the case. There were, I only gave one multiple choice question in my entire wow so so in in the university level in america you actually get multiple answer choice oh yes all the time all the time wow. this it's an absurdity al it's, that's like what we do with with children's school yes exactly it, it's huh. it's so it's so childish it's so pathetic there's no real education taking place uh, at the university level in this country mm. And they begged me once to, you know, this is a famous story or infamous. They begged me once to give an, a multiple choice exam, which I did. I, I gave an exam that consisted of one question yeah. and 28 <laughs> or 26 different answers, A through Z. You know, <laughs> pick, pick the answer. <laughs> That's so and funny. they begged me after that yeah. never to do that again, you know. <laughs> yeah, but the proof is in the pudding. So that means that you, you, you wanted them to learn the reason. Yes. Yeah, because because that system, although it will reward people who I have to look up the word. Give me a second. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I have to do the same thing, and I speak the language. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. W what you call a swat, a grind, a plodder. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so that kind of teaching is awarded, but understanding right. is not awarded by a multiple uh, choice answer. It's not awarded by the multiple choice questions. Mm. It's not awarded even by the university system. It's just an absurdity over here. Mm. The American American University is nothing but an indoctrination center. Yeah, but there, indeed. But that's that's not the example I want to give. I have another example I want to give. Oh, okay. Al, let me tell you a story. And I think I may have told you this story before. When I was mm -hmm. back teaching college, I was teaching a course in modern European history, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, from, let's say, the early Enlightenment up, uh, up through the two world wars. And, you know, we spent some time uh, going into these things. And I had a class of about 15 people, three or four, I forget the exact number, three or four of these students were education majors, all right? Mm -hmm. And these kids were absolutely the dumbest people I've ever taught in, <laughs> in my classes. 
And I, I came up with an examination and I gave a test and we had just finished World War One. So the first question on the examination was something like name five provisions of either the Treaty of Versailles or the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. <laughs> Simple enough question. List five provisions of the Treaty of Versailles and explain the implications of each. Okay. Mm. In other words, if it was an essay question. They actually, mm. I told the story in the book. They had to write out the answers, five significant points about the Treaty of Versailles. Okay, that was the mm. basic question. All right, now in the question, of course, I spell out Versailles, V E R S A I L L E S. In yeah, the question, in the heading, the, right? In the question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So obviously, I'm spelling Versailles, V E R S A I L L E S. Okay, mm. it's clearly there in the question. You don't have to know French. You don't have to know French. Yeah. But, you know, in the answer from one of these education majors, wrote the an one student wrote the answer, and in the answer, the student misspelled Versailles. I mean, it's right there in the question. It's spelled correctly in Versailles. Yeah. <laughs> I had the response, the Treaty of Versailles, and, and they spelled it V-E-R-S-I-G-H. Wow. And I thought, you know, how can you possibly be this dumb? <laughs> <laughs> or and, unattentive, or unattentive, yeah. even to the even to the test question. Yes, yeah. ver, sci, the English language noun, and then v e r tack on the front of <laughs> ver sci. <laughs> and it, Al, you have to marvel at the level of stupidity <laughs> of of having the word clearly spelled for you in the question, and then go on to to misspell it so egregiously and phonetically. Right. Like she imagined it was sounding. Yeah, mm. yeah. With with the clear, correct spelling, and still they couldn't get it. That's how bad it is. And that's what all of this teacher certification, pedagogical methodology classes, and all of the edubabble of the last 130 years have gotten us. Mm. And this was a person studying to go out and teach uh -huh. in public school. Right. And had been passed through the system. Yeah. And you, you know that this could not have been the only such mistake that she made in her college career. And she was already, by the time she entered my uh, European history class, she was already a junior. Mm. And I, again, this is probably why I never made tenure, because I took this exam right down to the dean. And I was livid. I said, what in the name of sense is this student doing in a teaching program and can't even think? Mm. Uh, it boggles my mind. I have horror stories like this from when I was a professor. And anybody that's a teacher in this country has their own list of, of horror stories that they've endured because of the system. Mm. And Al, there's every, every professor in the American education system right now, every teacher in the American system right now can tell you similar stories. Mm. That's how broken this country is. So please, for God's sake, over there in Europe, quit <laughs> emulating America. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you guys created this education system, uh, not this one, but at least laid the foundation for for academic mm. education why do you need to be following this this barbaric example of lunacy and stupidity and snowflaked entitlement mm. the whole system needs to be scrapped but what if you were like uh, having dyslexia and stuff then you couldn't uh, put us well sure but no this student didn't have dyslexia the student was simply stupid <laughs> 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 No Let's say uninformed. <laughs> no, stupid. <laughs> okay. Well, I think intelligence is not necessarily about knowledge, but how you apply it. Well, that too. But mm. still, if you can't have the intelligence to see and recognize <laughs> yeah. the correct spelling, yeah, that and should then, be a clear. You know, and yeah. then in in the answer, proceed to misspell it with with it clearly spelled, yeah. and that's one example. The other example I remember clearly is. Um, List three famous battles won by the Army of Northern Virginia during the American Civil War and who the opposing commanders were and what happened in the battle. You know, just describe it for me. Mm. Well, the Army of Northern Virginia, because the word northern was in it, 
Mm-hmm. That apparently was now being commanded by Ulysses Grant. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, it's just I, I can't. Al, I've got. I, I I used to keep a file folder. Went back when oh, I was of the, of the biggest stupidities uh, uh, of the. Yes, I did. <laughs> I did because it yeah. was just, and, and this was a consistent thing I noticed, particularly oh, right. with people that were education majors. Wow. They were the ones that had the most difficulty in yeah. my classes because they wanted me to wet nurse them and change their diapers for them all through class. And these people are, are the ones taking over. And these people are the ones going out as teachers certified to teach, mm. which I cannot do with a PhD from the oldest university in the English-speaking world without going and getting my teacher certification. I think that is Mm. abominable no you see it in you know always when they have a movie about teaching uh it's the solution is always that the teacher connects yes the, the pupils personally everything from uh, you know robin williams when yes. when he played his roles and you have a typical thing oh it's in the bronx or something like that oh we have to connect with them and that's the opposite of what's going on everybody is yes. becoming like in in uh, pink floyd's uh, well, the, wall. the wall yeah the wall. remember yeah, yeah. that's what's yeah. going on I'll, I'll tell you something during my time when i was teaching in college mm. I always had, I I mean, I would hit them right between the eyes the first day of class. I would let them know I'm not a teacher. I'm not an educator. I'm a professor. They knew I meant business from the first second of class, Mm. that this was going to be a different experience. And I would often tell them that I deliberately want you to see what a genuine college level course is really taught Mm. like. Mm. I want you to understand the difference between what you've been exposed to and a real professor. Mm. And I remember very clearly now, I had three standing ovations at the end of three of my classes back when I was teaching. Nice. And I had a few students in one particular class come up when the class was over and tell me, you are the first real professor I have ever had. Right. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. We all, everybody who has been in the educational system remembers, knows when they have, uh, everybody get a teacher like that. Yes. And and you never forget that. Exactly. Exactly. Because you're actually, you're, you're shaping fates, destinies. Yes. You're shaping people's minds and they understand that. You're giving them tools because education is really not about getting a degree. Education is getting the tools to continue educating yourself. Right. Is there any freedom today within the system for anyone to do something like what you did? No. Uh, Let me tell you, there's a story of a a mathematics professor at the University of California in Berkeley that was actually motivating his students to understand mathematics, but his approach in in pedagogical style was was not in conformity. So, you know, they they basically hounded him out. The reason I went to Oxford is because when I initially applied, I I actually applied to two or three PhD programs in this country and I was accepted. Mm. But in a couple of them, I was told that I had to, I had to attend certain classes. One in particular, I won't mention the institution, wanted me to attend a class in, at at the postgraduate level now, in using gender neutral language. Now, yeah. number one, I'm not I'm not on board with that whole program to begin with, and number two, I need I don't need to be spending my hard earned money on nonsense like this. I want to study what I want to study, mm. and I I eventually came to the conclusion after encountering several of these nutty programs, even in theology, even in patristics. <laughs> You need to put political correct language there. Yeah, you know, I, I, what is this? I, never yeah. mind never mind the theological reasons not to do that. Yeah. I just finally decided, you know, I've got to go to a place that will let me just be and study what I want to be and study. Mm-hmm. And that's why I decided to go to Oxford, because at that time you still could. Mm-hmm. Uh, this country is so shot through. I, I don't care what big name institution you're you're talking about. It's dominated by predominantly politically correct people. Mm. Good luck finding a, a conservative 
oriented faculty. Mm. We have a couple of institutions in this country that are so-called great books learning types of institutions, and they're under threat. Isn't isn't a conservative version than the Christian fundamentalist thing? That seems to be the only game they have. Well, in this, yeah, in this in this country, yeah, that's the other problem. Mm. You, you get this idea that conservatism has to be the American the American brand of Christianity, which is has absolutely no real historical ties. Evangelism, it, yeah. Yeah, evangelicalism, this revivalist religion in this country that everybody in this country thinks is Christianity. Mm. And it's not. It has no real connection with it. America is an anti-traditional country. Mm. And that's the bottom line. That's, that's the fundamental problem yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, I, I myself uh, is uh, a traditionalist, so... I know exactly what you mean. That, there's no room, there's no time for that anymore in, no, there isn't. Uh, in, any, it's in any American outlet. No, there isn't. And and this is very upsetting because what what is happening is America is being turned into not only a stinking, sinking garbage barge of a culture, it's being turned into a banana republic with nukes. Yeah. And we, we've got, I look at this political class just kind of like that like that economist op-ed piece that appeared in the economist magazine last July when when Jeb Bush and Hillary Clinton were still the front runners and here's the poor Brits looking across the pond and thinking my word you're you're playing this game again can't you do better can't you come up with something new can't you think mm. This country is in deep trouble, and it's because of the busybody millionaires like Bill Gates with their common core. We're going to do it all with computers and standardized, individually adapted tests and all of this happy nonsense. Mm. No, uh, that system is going to crash. What I think is going to happen is you're going to see an underground education mm. grow in this country. You're going to yeah, see you're, private. you're already – yeah, private. You're going to see underground. This is this is a part of it, actually. Oh yeah, absolutely. The only only you can't get a job uh, <laughs> afterwards. Yeah, <laughs> create your own. Well, yeah. But the bottom line here is is that this materialistic consumer philosophy has basically created. I, I mean, just look at the American election process right now, and look at the idiots that that are running for president in mm. this country, mm. and they cannot hold a an adult like discussion without crawling into the gutter and slinging mud and ad hominems and you know it's it's just pathetic yeah so yeah i've it, actually kept on one eye on the election we will not go too deep into it's it. not it's not worth keeping anything no. more than an eye on <laughs> <laughs> no but uh, from what i can surmise uh, there's only one guy who's actually talking about issues and that's sanders but, yeah thank you right but, but the problem with him and is that he's is, repeating himself all the time and not only that he's a He's a Bolshevik. I mean, <laughs> that too. But well, uh, no. Well, actually, in in Norwegian terms, we'd call him um, center. But he's the only one talking about issues. But it's the same speech every time. Every time. At least the others vary their speech. But what do they fill it with? Like you said, ad hominem. Uh, yeah. You know, the size of their gender, <laughs> or the the wives. How pretty their wives are. Yeah, it's nuts. It's uh, totally. Uh, yeah, but oh my god, I I should probably not say that, but. Even a crazy guy like Trump, one side of me would rather see him than Hillary. Oh, okay. <laughs> just because Hillary means no change. And at this point, we need a change, even if it's a change to the worse. So that's just my two cents on that. I'll, I'll probably get a lot of angry listeners because Trump, <laughs> we're really afraid of him here in Europe. <laughs> but back to education. Um, by the way, what state did you teach in? Well, at, I, I've taught in several states. Sorry about my crumpling here, but I've taught in uh, Oklahoma. I taught uh, patristics at an Eastern Orthodox seminary for about three years as uh, assistant professor of patristics. So I've been kind of all over. Yeah, did you notice differences from state to state? Oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, that, you know, that's a part of that's kind of a part of American culture that's that's difficult maybe for some people to understand. The the coasts have their own culture. The interior of the country has a very, very different sort of, of feel to it. Mm. Uh, the, the the northeastern part of the country is is yet again different. Uh, it 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 really depends on where you are. Uh, 
Mm. But but the bottom line is, regardless of where you are in the in the country, the, the educational system is at best mediocre, yeah. and 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 I'm putting very friendly terms on that. <laughs> um, I, I think American education is just an absolute disaster. Mm. Uh, it was bad even back when I decided to go on and do my doctorate, and I finally just had had enough with with every American university I was looking at. I said, that's it. I've, I've got to get out of this country if I want to do real postgraduate work and, and not be subjected to this indoctrination mill. Um, you know, the libertarians, they have this sympathetic uh, approach where they want to leave uh, the details to the state. Now, of course, that's a two-edged sword because if a state yes. is retarded enough, it can even be <laughs> it can even be worse than a um, you know middle this, ground, right? This but, is true. <laughs> but on the other hand, it gives some leeway to improve and in a way to create a natural selection because if a state get its shit together and get some decent education out there. They will get better people, and in the long term, they will uh, win the competition. So, so uh, I'm kind of thinking maybe it's an advantage to have us, you know, to get rid of the federal educational uh, department and leave it to the states. So, what do you think about that as an insider? Well, it's it's been and it used to be a hot button political issue. Uh, I remember Ronald Reagan running for president and his promises to abolish the Department of Education, which of course he never did. Uh, I I really don't see the federal Department of Education ever being gotten rid of, unfortunately. But what I do see happening, perhaps, is as as more and more people in this country wake up mm. to just how bad American education really is, I think you're going to see a a rise of private schools uh, e and even of the tutoring system, kind of like uh, you know the prep school thing in in Great Britain, the way it used to function there. Do you have Waldorf schools in America? We do have private schools, but I think what's going to become an absolute necessity, I, what I what I see happening is as more and more teachers themselves leave the system in frustration, and they are mm. in this country, that what's going to happen is they're, they're going to be uh, sought out by the people that have the money and, and opportunity to educate their kids mm. privately. There's an interesting thing going on in American education that shows you shows you the real hypocrisy of it. Because you've got this move now in the United States called Common Core. And the, the real heart of this, Al, is to make everything computer-based so that the teacher basically becomes nothing more than a functionary uh -huh. for administering the, com the curriculum that comes through the computers and administering the tests that mm. come through the computers. But if you go to Silicon Valley in this country, where people there have the money to send their kids to private school, you'll discover something very interesting. And that is those people, the, the tech geeks themselves, insist on sending their kids to schools where there are no computers, none, no mm. tablets, no iPhones, no computers, where everything is being done the good old fashioned way. Yeah, like Montessori and Waldorf. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, I'm a stickler for this because the best times that I can reflect on in my education, all the way back from, from kindergarten all the way through graduate school, were those encounters with those teachers or professors that were, you know, straight out of a, a you know, like a character straight out of a Charles Dickens novel. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that little, made, little Timmy. <laughs> yeah, the, yes. Yeah, that, that, made, that made you think that really challenged you and, and were there to help you learn how to think critically and, and yeah. not to be intimidated by authority and, and degrees and, you know, so on and so forth that actually trained you to be an independent critical thinker. Mm. And, you know, I, I can, I can still name you my teachers that influenced me that way. My second grade teacher, fourth grade and so on and so forth. Yeah, all, same with me. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a computer's not going to do this for you. Good point. If you're responding to a bunch of anonymous programmers 
working for the Education Testing Corporation in, in Princeton, uh, you're you're always in the position of having to second guess and read someone's mind. Mm. And the other thing that we point out in this book is that the standardized tests themselves, which are supposedly designed to test your knowledge, oftentimes contain such egregious errors. And biases, right? And, and biases. And, and the There's, framing itself, right? And, and the framing itself, yes, mm. precisely. Oftentimes, you, you'll run into questions where you know more than the test makers yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. And so answers that, that they think are incorrect are actually correct. And I, I cite one example uh, in the book that I found. Our, my co-author and I were looking at test questions and so on from the past. But there's one, one question that just kind of floored me. One was a question uh, that began, Emperor is the name of, and you were given three, three selections, a concerto, mm -hmm. a quartet, and a symphony. Uh, that was the three answers you were supposed to pick from. Okay. And, of course, the correct answer, supposedly, according to the test makers, was concerto, you know, Beethoven's fifth piano concerto. Mm -hmm. But, you know, th this is actually incorrect because it's also the name of a Haydn string quartet. <laughs> ah, so right. so if, you, if you're coming into that test with a little bit more knowledge, right. then how do you answer the question? Well, you can't. And there are examples of this over and over and over in, in the American testing so-called business. And it's, it basically boils down to, Al, is that the whole thing is, is a gigantic fraud. Mm. Um, because what these tests do, ultimately, is they punish people with the finer mind. Right. And yeah, because there's no nuances. I mean, if you no, come exactly. into a, a predetermined uh, choice test and you have that knowledge that you just uh, exemplified, there's no way you can even convey this to the incompetent exactly. uh, teacher. So, yeah. Yeah, you're, you're or selecting the computer. or a computer. Yeah, mm. you're, you're selecting from prepared answers. There's no way for you to explain your process of reasoning. Yeah. There's no there's no interaction. It's and the the sad thing here, Al, is that this was all part of a design that my co-author and I go into some length to try and show people was a a sorting and slotting mechanism. It was really done to socially engineer the country. Yeah. So, you know, this is the other thing. You're 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 actually punishing people for having intelligence and you're slotting mediocrity exactly. into top positions. So. Yes, I experienced this actually. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, I have too. Yeah, and this was with a person as a teacher. So if even people are not to account for rewards for excellence, I mean, what can computers do? In my case, it was maths. And this was before I knew, uh, today I know a little about, uh, maybe we could call it um, occult mathematics, mathematic. Yes. I know a little about that. I knew nothing about this back then. I, I admit I hadn't done my, my homework properly, but I solved the question intuitively by going by an other route than what right. was expected. Now, the teacher gave me an error because I didn't go through the proper route. I, I, I went to a shorter route that was waterproof foolproof, mm -hmm. gave the same result, right. was not rewarded. I don't expect to get a, a better degree than those who followed that, but at least I should get some payback for having been creative enough to solve it. Right, exactly. <laughs> but no, no, I was punished for going, for straying away from the... For straying yeah. away from, from the orthodox methodology. Yes. I, it, believe me, I've been there. <laughs> yeah, I, I do. <laughs> believe me, I've been there. So it's frustrating indeed. It's very frustrating. Mm. Absolutely. And particularly to the student that knows they're right and yeah, that are put yeah. into this straitjacket of having to conform to a test which in its own turn has been compiled by mediocrities. Mm. And, you know, this brings me back to, to the fact that, that if you're going to assess someone, this is why I gave essay tests when I was a professor. I want to know the process of reasoning behind Mm. what people are saying and i also want to see if they can articulate their thoughts mm. Mm. because you know francis bacon said writing maketh the full man yeah and that's true because you can have all the correct thoughts in the world but if you can't articulate them or cannot articulate each little step of your logic 
and bring other people along in your thought process, then, you know, communication breaks down and we're back to square one. So as far as I'm concerned, Al, there's really no mechanical uh, materialistic shortcut that you can bring to this process of transmitting human knowledge from generation to generation other than through human contact of some sort. Mm -hmm. Uh, And this is particularly true and particularly frustrating once you get into college, into the graduate level and postgraduate studies. You want to be surrounded by people that really know their stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you I'll give you something that always struck me about the difference between American education and what I would call the traditional European, you know, university, Oxbridge, Heidelberg, you know, type of approach. Mm. And that is, if you ask an American college student what they are doing, in other words, what's their academic pursuit, they'll tell you that they're majoring in a subject. If you go to Oxford and ask the same question, you'll be asked, what are you reading? Ah, right. You see the difference? Mm -hmm. The difference is the American system, the major is simply you're going into a pre-slotted program where you spend X amount of credit hours in these subjects. You then go to your class and the professor has to tick off your name in a roll call book, just like elementary school. Mm. And at the end of this process, you, you get a degree that supposedly tells you you know something about the subject. And in that whole process, Al, you will seldom be exposed. For example, I taught medieval history hmm. back when I was a professor. And I taught with a, a, a textbook that was a real textbook. In other words, it was a collection of primary texts hmm. that people had to read. Philip Abelard, Thomas Aquinas, John Dunn Scotus, and people like this. In other words, you were actually reading what they said and not what some professor was summarizing for you, what they said. Mm. And American education, by and large, unfortunately, when you pick up an American textbook, it isn't a textbook in the classical traditional sense at all. What it is, is it's a set of secondary sources referring to primary sources So in other words, American education doesn't even put you into contact Mm. with Plato or with Aristotle or Aquinas or Kant or or what have you. Mm. Uh, Very rarely does this happen at at the general education college level. You have to go on to graduate school. So in other words, what you're learning in Europe by the time you get out of the European high school – is what American graduate students have to specialize in and spend a lot of money to find out. I see. It's just, it's lunacy. Mm. It's just total, total lunacy. Mm. So I used to tell my students, you know, I used to ask, why are you here in this class? Well, to get a degree. And my response was, well, you can go to a Masonic Lodge and get a degree. And it's a lot more fun and it's a lot less money. Yeah. You know. <laughs> so, I, I guess your point. But, uh, you know, you make a very good point also about <clears throat> expecting the pupils to have – because finer education means you, you have to have a master of independent absolutely. thought and to be, express yourself and the subject matter. Exactly. So that makes all the sense in the world. Now, like I said, I, I'm keeping an eye at the uh, election and I don't know when this will be out to the general public, this program. But as we speak today, mm-hmm. there is actually a potential for Sanders to win the yeah. Democratic nomination. Mm-hmm. And if he does, he may also win the national. Now, I, I'm expecting CIA to finish him or Donald Trump off with a <laughs> bullet or poison or whatever if they win. But let's just uh, say for the sake of argument that he does win. And I, I do believe him when he says that he want to bring American education. He, he argues that like when you were a child, what mm-hmm. you got for free education in America then equals what you get for free education today if you include college. He argues that today all this should be free. Now, let's say he actually manages not only to win the presidency, but even implement 
-hmm. Because that's another question, how to get change in America with Citizen United and all that shit. But well, let's say he, he does. Do you think that will pouring more money into the system is bound to also change the quality? No. Or what's the challenges there? What, what will happen under that uh, scenario? No, I, I don't. All I'm hearing from Sanders is the same thing I've heard for the last all my life about mm -hmm. American education. We need more money. No, we don't need more money. We need a change of the philosophy mm. that has been ruling American education for the past 150 years. That's what we need. We need to get back to the idea that hardcore subject. Let me give you an example. One of the things that the progressive theorists did was they abolished history, geography, uh, the classics, you know, learning Latin or Greek a, as a matter of course in your in your elementary and, and middle school education. And you know Americans as well as I do. Very few of us know a modern foreign language yeah. uh, well enough to speak conversationally. I, I didn't start studying German until high school, and fortunately, you know, I had I had four years of it. I had and I had real Germans teaching it, mm. but. Um, we need to get rid of this idea that all of this, which is what the progressives did, gets lumped together in a catch-all subject matter called humanities. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. this is what happens in the United States. <clears throat> so you don't you don't learn the basics of European history or culture. You don't learn the basics of American history or culture. It's just all kind of thrown together in a big catch-all in which it becomes so general that you don't end up learning anything. Mm. And the same is true, really, if you if you look at the approach to the sciences in this country, to the to the arts in this country. So in other words, throwing more money into a system which has already been co-opted by this philosophy is not going to solve the problem. It's only going to make it worse. Mm. The, the, the entire edifice needs to come crashing down and the, the restoration of the idea of a teacher as being, if not an expert, at least competent in the subjects that they are required to teach. Yeah rather than being competent in the latest educational fad or methodology or pedagogy. Hmm. Uh, and again, let me give you an example of what really goes on in this country. Uh, let's say you're a teacher of uh, English, English literature, mm -hmm. if you're that lucky. <laughs> you <know. Yeah. coughs> Pardon me. Most of your time as a teacher will be spent out of the class attending what are called continuing education or continuing professional education. And what these are, your school district will send you to a conference or make you stay after school where the local state education commissar shows up and they put you through these ridiculous childish exercises, passive aggression, quite literally is what they're based on. Hmm. And what you're doing is you're learning the latest education pedagogical theory or fad. Mm -hmm. Very seldom, if ever, will a teacher be required to go to a conference where they listen to papers in their profession. In other words, the latest papers about literary criticism mm. or the latest papers about deconstruction or, or what have you. In other words, they're not focused on the discipline itself. Mm. In, in these continuing education seminars. Uh, if, you're a prof if you're a teacher of high school mathematics, it's the same thing. You go to these professional education things, but very rarely will your school district pay for you to go and listen to papers of, of the latest research in mathematics mm. or physics or chemistry or biology or what have you. So this is the problem. The focus is all on method. The focus is all on typical American obsession, all on technology, all on all of this stuff. And there's no focus at all on, on the basics. Mm. So I say, you know, pouring more money into it. No, that's that's not going to fix it. We've been we've been hearing that for decades and more and more money keeps getting poured into it, and Americans keep coming out dumber and stupider <laughs> than the last generation. So, so yeah. if it's really the philosophy of the educational system that has to change, isn't yes. this a case then yes. for 
implementing actually a federal educational uh, system because what way could you change the entire nation's educational system if not through then I'll tell you I'll tell yep. you what what would have to be done is get the federal government out of it altogether mm. get the teaching certification process overturned in other words the i i with a phd from the oldest university in the english speaking world cannot go into an american public school and teach let's say history or philosophy What? without going through classes to get teacher certification uh -huh. and what these classes are are simply classes telling you how to dumb people down, mm. uh, requiring you to, to go through the most uh, insane, absurd, childish exercises in pedagogy. And none of this is focused on actually teaching the subject. Mm. So that has to go. Mm. We have to be able to have local school districts have to be able to look at someone and say this person is competent in mathematics or whatever and hire that teacher mm. but this is not what has happened in this country the exact opposite is what has happened and as far as i'm concerned i put the blame squarely at the feet of the government at local state and, and federal in this country um, uh, we need we need also to give a shout out to the poor students because yes, not only are they being dumbed down not only are they being punished if they are knowledgeable or intelligent right. or creative but in addition to all that if you manage to suffer through this system You, your prospects are to be punished twice because when you're done with your education, you're in so much debt that yeah, you can never absolutely. even get your head above water. That's right. And you don't get any job either, by the right, way. Exactly. So it's like, okay, your, your friend, he went into your father's uh, used car business uh, without going through college. And he's now a millionaire. Right. And you are now a millionaire in debt. Yep. And you can't even get a job. Right. And you have a, the, the best degree America can offer. So Well, it's it's worse than that. It's I'll tell you, if you plan to go into an academic career in this country, it's all but impossible to make a living. And here's why. Mm -hmm. Most universities in this country are – most of the instruction is now being done by ad, what are called adjunct professors. Right. These are people that do all of the actual classroom teaching. They get paid – a part-time salary, which is usually paid once a semester. So in other words, you're barely able to eke out a living, if that. Mm. While the administrators in these big universities are getting paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to shuffle paper. Ah, just like in a healthcare system. Exactly. Huh, exactly. And that's no coincidence. Hey, no, of course not. This is all. This is all by a very deliberate design. So this is actually a bureaucracy. Yep. The bureaucrats are getting rewarded all over the board, and yep. those who do the dirty work are barely yep. managing. Huh. Yep. The reason they went to adjuncts is precisely because they didn't want to have to pay health care benefits and oh, so yeah. on and so forth. Yeah, you know, so yeah. it's a vicious circle. Uh, I don't see it getting better in any government related program in this country it's it's just it's it's so appalling now i can't even begin to explain to you how appalling it is all right right um uh, homeschooling joseph mm -hmm. what do you think about that well i have mixed i have mixed feelings about it quite frankly al because um in principle philosophically i'm not opposed to it um, because the public system in this country is just really, really bad. I, I just blogged about an article. I have a schedule coming up where Harvard and Yale University have both accepted Saudi money to set up Muslim Sharia law centers <laughs> in their law departments. You know, and I'm thinking, come They on. They got something back for the money they invested, I see. <laughs> well, I guess. It's just, it's just so bad. Mm. This is a system of law that has nothing in common with Western jurisprudence, certainly not American. 
It, it, the public school system over here, Al, I, I can't begin to tell you how nutty it really is. Uh, people. Well, you told you told a lot already. So. Well, yeah, but but my and problem, the proof is in the pudding, by the way. We see. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah that's the problem. <laughs> mm. We're turning out a bumper crop of idiots and, and entitled snowflakes in this country. Uh, just look at the reaction in this last election. I've never seen anything like it. Mm. It's just it's just childishness. It's it's petulance. But my problem with homeschooling in this country, on the other hand, is that typically it has been the uh, the bailiwick. It's been the home for for evangelical fundamentalists to pull their kids out of the public school system and indoctrinate them with all sorts of craziness. The earth was created 4,000 years ago or 4,000 BC or whatever the absurd date is. Mm. It's been an excuse to to indoctrinate kids with with just a bunch of nonsense. And that's my fear. Um, I would have no problem with friends of mine that I know personally homeschooling their kids because they're not crazy. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if Dr. Hart homeschooled, they would have yeah, a professor. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they'd have a professor homeschooling. You know, I don't have any problem with that. But if Sarah Palin homeschools, I mean. <laughs> well, yeah, that's the other problem. See, this is <laughs> this is the problem. No, you can't look out of your house at Anchorage and see Russia, Sarah. You know, this, this is not the way it but, works. But, but you see, this this is this actually shows that we have a common problem with with public schools and homeschooling because um, in homeschooling, yeah. it's true you would bright parents. Parents would get bright children and, and dumb parents would get dumb children. Right. But how do the public system preserve those who are above and below the average? Because in Norway, we've had an ideal uh, of, uh, I would say, more or less uniformitarian, I mean, um, a social democracy, right? Everybody's going to be the same. Mm -hmm. And that has its pluses and it has its minuses. As far as schools concerns, the plus is that they take care of the weak ones. Right. But the minuses is that uh, there's no stimulation for those who are above. Exactly. Exactly. The average, right? So how yeah. do we solve this problem? Well, quite frankly, Al, I think, I think we have to get rid of the, the, what you're calling the social democracy philosophy of education that, you know, we're going to take care of everybody. In other words, the way that translates to me in this country, and I'm fairly certain that it probably translates the same way in Europe. And that's the idea that, that there's one model of education for everybody. Mm -hmm. And then you make, then you make special allowances for, for those who are a little slower and you make special allowances for those who might be a little quicker. They don't do that. They don't make yeah. special allowances for the quicker ones. Well, that's, it's the same in this country too, mm. with a few exceptions locally. You know, I grew up in a public school system where, uh, if you showed a particular aptitude in certain areas, they would skip you several mm. grades. That that happened to me in mathematics. I started uh, taking accelerated math when I got into to, um, middle school. Mm. So there are a few local systems still left in this country where they'll do that sort of thing. And, and you know, I approve of it. My dad had the same thing happen to him. He was skipped several grades in everything. <laughs> wow. he was, yeah, he was a very smart man. But the the problem the problem is this one size fits all and and you're exactly. right exactly uh, that's why they want to lift the slow ones so they come in the right. middle and that's why they want to keep right. down the quick ones so they come yes, in the exactly. middle too <laughs> this, this is what always happens you know i remember uh, this happened to me i remember at a very very early age uh, it really began in elementary mm. school and, and then continued out through the rest of my schooling i was one of those kids that was bored in school almost all the time and it was because the teachers were constantly having to spend all of their attention with with the slow kids mm. and and what this did is it it dragged everybody else down so we've got to get back to the notion that schooling is best left to to the local school boards to the parents and we have to get we have to get rid of this idea that technology is the fix all for everything because I can remember my my good teachers I can still name some of my elementary school teachers that had a huge influence and a positive influence on mm. me 
uh, we've got to get rid of this idea that technology is a substitute for the human interaction and, and contact. But basically, you're saying that uh, we should allow for as much as possible individuality. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I really believe that. In this country, for a great period of time, particularly in the 19th century, when you had the the westward expansion across the country, you had teachers quite literally in a one-room schoolhouse teaching several grades of kids at the same time. Hmm. So in other words, you had fourth graders mixed with eighth graders and, and so on and so forth. And, and oh, was, yeah, they do that in Waldorf schools too. Yeah, they still do. Hmm. And actually the model works very well. Our reading literacy in this country in the 19th century, you look at, at the old McGuffey readers that, that were a standard textbook in American education at that time, and you read what, what eighth, seventh or eighth graders were expected to read, and it would now be considered college level. Mm. If not, if not graduate level reading requirements, because the vocabulary requirements were very, very stiff. Mm. Uh, and now we're turning out kids that can't even read when they graduate from high school. And I ran into this as a professor. Uh, I had I had kids coming into my classes that could barely read, but they were passed through school because they were good athletes. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I had I had a young black man, very nice guy. And uh, he was he was very smart, but he couldn't read. He wow. read at a fourth grade level. Hmm. And I, you know, I pulled him aside after class one day. He'd signed up for my medieval history class, which <laughs> you can imagine was just way, way beyond his ability. But that's fitting for someone who can't read. Well, yeah, medieval, you know, medieval, medieval times. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, this is, in a certain sense, yeah, but it's a difficult area of history. You're you're dealing with so much philosophy and. Canada. Yeah, but it was a pun to the fact that they were an alphabet back then. <laughs> well, yeah. And this poor guy, I pulled him out and I said, I'm administrative will withdraw you because you're, you're just not going to make it in this class. And I started mm. asking him questions. How can you go all the way through school? What happened? And I said, were you an athlete? And he said, yeah. And I, you know, that was it right there. Ding, ding, yeah. ding. This poor guy had been used like a piece of meat and pass through the entire school system simply because he could play basketball and baseball. Very American phenomenon, that. Yeah, yeah it's very it, – It's and to me, I'm repulsed by it. So this is the other thing I think we need to, to get back to in this country is we have to get rid of this idea that athletics is the center of our academic system. Very, very alien to Europeans. Yes. We don't have that thing oh. with uh, colleges uh, – operating as professional right. uh, sports uh, organizations right. and people, you know, buying people. And uh, yeah, like you say, uh, we can get you through all kinds of... I, I didn't know it was that bad. You can't, you can't even read and you can go through it. That's... Yeah, well, this... And, and Al, this was back when I was a professor in the 1990s. And I shudder to think what it's like now. Uh, yeah, you know, we yeah. and I've said this many times. We need to get rid of phys ed, of physical education in the public school systems altogether. Let the kids go out and play for recess and and have their baseball teams and so on. But it's not part of an academic curriculum. This whole move for physical education was introduced by the progressivists in this country in the late 19th century. And it mm -hmm. began to enter the public school system at that point. And since then, we've seen a steady decline with all of this emphasis on athletics. Kids that are in the school orchestra or the school band or things like this uh, are not or, – or the poetry club. You know, they're made fun of. They're, they're not – they're not extolled for their for their academic accomplishments and this is this is you know it's 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 upside down from what it needs to be so you've got this huge national infrastructure president bush's no child left behind and now common core these are all federal programs and they've been colossal failures it's just been mm. it's just been a way for the big textbook companies and and testing services and so on to make money at the public trough and I, I've got to tell you, Al, <laughs> Catherine Fitz uh, recently started this crowdfund project to buy me a virtual pipe organ. You know, I, I know yeah. <laughs> I, I spread it on Twitter. Well, yeah, and, you know, this came out. This came like a bolt out of the blue. So she had this. Uh, she had this this launch party in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and we all met in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and went out to a pub. And one of the people that attended was a teacher. Mm. And 
she in our in our discussion she told me that the reason that she had quit teaching just a couple years ago well before retirement age was that mm-hmm. under common core she had a a set of universal lesson plans that she had to adhere to in other words she had to get her students to such and such a place by such and such a time and I, I said, you're kidding. She says, no, I'm not. And I said, how in the name of sense are you supposed to to tailor your lesson plans with your group of kids to some lesson plan cooked up by a bunch of federal bureaucrats who have had no contact with them? This is an impossibility. This is this one-size-fits-all cookie-cutter method again. And Ultimately, what it leads to are the big American university degree mills. It's not working. Mm. I'm in the John Taylor Gatto camp here. He's a famous American teacher that's written a number of books about education in this country. And he comes right out and says the whole system, top to bottom, has to be scrapped. Mm. Just throw it out. Is this a contemporary guy? Oh, yeah. Yeah, very, very contemporary. Last name is G-A-T-T-O. Uh, he's written a number of very good books. Um, <clears throat> we cited him briefly at length uh, in some chapters and briefly in others in, in our Common Core book because he's been saying the same thing for years and years and years. This is not just something that started with Common Core, although I I and my co-author, we kind of view Common Core as the reductio ad absurdum. Because in one sense, the assessment process of Common Core is trying to address this individual approach by making the standardized tests individually adaptable. But this is a fix on top of a fix that, that just isn't going to work because you're as a student, you're put into the position of having to guess what's in the mind of the people making these tests and the people are anonymous. <laughs> and the test questions are proprietary information owned by the corporations. So how are you, the students, supposed to guess what cor- the correct answers are? And how's the teacher supposed to teach to them? Mm-hmm. So, you know, any way you look at this, Al, this is a colossal boondoggle. Uh, it, it's nothing but a scheme to enrich the, the educational establishment with their nutty theories to enrich the corporations. And in the process, I just did a blog, Al, about a week and a half ago about American scores in mathematics vis-a-vis the rest of the industrialized world. And guess where America came in? Very low, I guess. I think it was like 35th or 36th. Yeah. Yeah, we are behind every major industrialized power in the world. We're behind all of the smaller countries in Europe, Norway, Sweden, and so on and so forth. We're behind all of those countries. We're behind Finland. We're probably behind... Oh, yeah, Finland is, is on the top, so that's yeah. uh, everybody's behind yeah. them. <laughs> yeah, and, and we're, we're ahead of, of such educational bulwarks as Croatia, Albania, and Mexico. Right. Uh, wow. in, yeah. And Al, you cannot preserve... Um, great power status, you cannot have a workable infrastructure when you're graduating year after year classes of idiots. Mm. Sooner or later, the elevators are going to start crashing and the airplanes are going to start crashing and doctors are not going to be able to read. It's just not. Well, you know, you know, no, no, no. They compensate. They import brilliant people from abroad to fix that. Well, yeah. And this is the other problem. You don't need to import people from abroad, you know. So it, well, the, the way things are going, America have to because of the incompetence that's ruling, right? So, so yeah. but I agree, you shouldn't, you ought not to do that. Well, yeah, if you if you really extend the argument, you could make a case that this is really a big social engineering experiment yeah. and and a way of of so dumbing down the American middle class that eventually there won't be a middle class and and you can remake things to your own choosing. And I think a considerable degree of what we've seen happening in this country for the last hundred years in education is a bit of that philosophy at work. Uh, But again, you know, it's not, it's not working because people are waking up to the fact that this has all been a huge scam and, and uh, we're not going to take it anymore. Um, uh, and a sign that people are educating themselves uh, exactly. outside outside of the um, establishment channels right. is the fact that the critical tilt now uh, has been proven yep. 
that the people didn't elect Clinton right. shows that they are awakening to yeah. because many many people think Trump won the election. No, he didn't. No. Clinton lost the Clinton election. Clinton lost it. Yeah, yeah. I agree with you. Uh, it was it was hers for the taking, but she was arrogant. She was stupid. The the media made a huge, you know, I call it the corporate, the global corporate controlled propaganda media because that's what it became in this election. They have so shot themselves in the foot, and Americans are are turning to other sources for their information and starting to think critically, which I think is a good sign. And this is what I've told people all along. And going back to my own educational experience, I, I, ha I, I grew up in a good public school system, but it still had its problems. And, and I was bored. And just kind of on my own, I determined at a very early age that I'm going to go out and teach myself. I'm going to read the things I want to learn myself mm. and do enough to get by in the public system. And that's what I did. I continued that habit all the way through my entire educational life, and I'm still doing it. And I Yeah, but nowadays people uh, have to do it outside of the system. Yeah. I, and yeah. fortunately, we have the independent media, so, right. so it's possible. Right. They have independent media. You know, I've been asked by several teenaged American kids in the past few years, well, if this, and they're, they're aware, that what's really heartening is that they're aware that the system itself is shortchanging them. Mm -hmm. And they will ask, well, what do I do to educate myself? And I, I would usually tell them, well, you just said what you need to do. You need to educate yourself. <laughs> Go out and read the books in the, in the subject areas that you want to read that interest you. And gradually expand from there. Go from there. If you want to read about philosophy, you know, pick up Plato or Aristotle or Hegel or Kant and read them. Yeah, but I guess the part of the problem is that because everything is connected to everything, and if you look at economics, mm -hmm. uh, people have to have two and three jobs now. Yes. And I heard uh, just recently from a friend uh, what the norm is for the amount of hours people work over there. And it's incredible. You yes. have no private life. No. You have barely time to sleep, and then it's back to the treadmill. Yep. So how can people educate themselves under those circumstances? No wonder. No wonder America is in the predicament it is. Yeah. Well, it, it, this is the other problem. And I think this was a, a huge part of, of Trump's winning. Obama has absolutely decimated middle class leisure time and leisure income and there are certain businesses and industries in this country that have suffered as a result of it and i think you know we're looking at the backlash right now and if you're a family as you say that's working two or three jobs just to make things get by uh, you know that something's wrong in spite of all the things that the president gets up and says, well, I presided over an economic recovery and I've created all these new jobs. Well, yeah, the new jobs you've created are all part time because uh, you, Walmart jobs. That's what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So uh, education in this country to me, Al, is, is a symptom of what's wrong with the country as a whole. It's it's more federal involvement, you know, and I'm a, I, in this sense, I'm a classic libertarian. Things work when the government gets out of the way. Yeah, um, yeah. So you have the same thing in Europe. You, you have the overregulation of businesses and so on and so forth. And people don't want to start up a business. So sorry, Mr. Younger down there. Can't afford it. No, they can't afford it. The, yeah, exactly. The only businesses that uh, stimulated are local branches of multinational corporations. Exactly, exactly. And it's the same here. Mm. So, you know, as a result of this, you, you find the middle class drying up. And so there's this huge backlash against all of this. And it's not going to stop. They've just been handed a huge, you know, Mr. Global he has been handed a huge defeat. And it's not going to stop. I really don't think it'll stop. No, no, no. All of our files are free and will remain free. If you like the show, you can show support by donating $1 to help with expenses. Just use the PayPal link on our website, YouTube channel, or Facebook page. Thanks. But um, what's the optimal pedagogics? And I don't mean like 
Mm -hmm. necessarily a, a recognized system or philosophy that's already out there, but like right. elements or, or whatever. What, what do you think about that would be, be, well, um, yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very old fashioned. Al. I believe in the, in the trivium and quadrivium, quite frankly. Mm. And, and I believe, I believe strongly in the idea that a textbook should be a book of texts, <laughs> not, not something that someone says about somebody, but rather if you're going to have a textbook of, of English literature, by golly, let's have some John Donne and Oscar Wilde and William Shakespeare and, you know, all of the people that have made English literature, English literature and French literature, French literature and mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, I think Americans absolutely have to start studying a foreign language in elementary school and not wait until high school. I can recommend that. I couldn't have this discussion with you if we didn't do this. Exactly. You know, you go to Europe, everybody in Europe speaks English and probably one or two other languages. Yeah. French, you know, German, yeah. Mm. French, German or something. Or Russian, you know? yeah. Mm. Or Russian, yeah. We need to get back to this idea. And again, it was the progressives in the country that got rid of it because in, in the 19th century in America, you still had classes in Latin. Mm. So, and which is a helpful thing to have if you want to. Yeah, we well, used to have that too. Sure, exactly. If you want to know word roots in the English language, my word, Latin has had a huge influence mm. on English and everybody else. So, you know, I would definitely say foreign language, get back to the idea of textbooks, read the primary sources. This should be done at the beginning. I'm all for making music a central piece of education simply because music, and I've said this over and over again. Music teaches you to think on several tracks at the same time. Mm. And to be, if you're dealing with the great classical composers, it teaches you to recognize patterns and their permutations. It, in other words, it, it is the best education for dot connecting that you can possibly imagine. Mm. So, you know, I, again, that's something else I think that needs to be front and center. We absolutely must restore mathematics in this country to a standard of rigor. Al, when I took algebra, when I was in school, like mm -hmm. I said, I was, I was skipped a couple of grades in mathematics. So when I began algebra in the seventh grade, my algebra teacher, we went through about four to six weeks of Boolean algebra, of symbolic logic hmm. in the seventh grade. Nowadays, in America, you would not get Boolean algebra until college or graduate school. And, and there's no reason that these things have to be delayed. Kids are smarter, much smarter, mm. than we give them credit for. So, again, I would, I would put mathematics front and center. I have to say that studies also show that uh, if you introduce stuff early to kids and you do it in a playful way, Yes. Not the factory way, but in a creative way, right. where association, right. uh, stimulate intuition, creativity. Right. Then they take much better to it and they get a positive relation to it. So they want to yes. pursue it when they get older and the play is... Right, is, is still an element. Absolutely. Yeah. And again, Al, you cannot do that with a computer or a robot. You have to have a human teacher in the classroom doing this. Indeed. And so the American fascination with technology is actually hurting us when it comes to education, mm. because what it's reducing the teacher to is a, a proctor of a standardized test every four weeks. It reduces the teacher to being a, a functionary mm. of a federally dictated lesson plan, and that's not teaching that's administering. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly right. And I don't blame this lady for retiring, but Al, you know, I've got so many teachers on my website, my friendship with Dr. DeHart, my co-author Gary Lawrence. I've got mm. several teachers on my website, and they all tell me the same thing. And I tell them, I don't know how you do it. Mm. I do, you know, because effectively, Al, what they are doing in the classroom is, is willfully and intentionally subversive mm. of – the federal dictations and the federal law, and they know it, hmm. and their students know it. The students in this country do sense that there is something terribly wrong with education. They can they can come into contact with a Dr. DeHart or myself, and they realize immediately that they are not dealing with the typical product of an American school system. 
Mm. because they're made to think, they're made to work, and yet they enjoy it. Yeah, at this point, I think maybe the majority knows that the system is broken, but the, the, oh, I, yeah. I, I think the problem is the solution. Um, what right. is the solution? And, and you've mentioned some stuff now, like music, foreign language, uh, other things you think would change things in a better direction. Well, yeah, I think absolutely, Al, we have to start exposing kids to, to philosophy mm. uh, at, an, at an early age. Uh, I would even go so far as to say you could start exposing them to it in elementary school. But by junior high school, I think kids need to start actually reading a little Plato and reading some Aristotle and reading some Kant and so on and discussing what all of these things mean. And again, that may sound crazy because, you know, in the American system now, you don't get this until high school at best, college probably. But again, you're getting it in the form of an American textbook that tells you what these people said and what they thought rather than actually reading them. Mm -hmm. I, I think a way to hook kids into Plato would be have them read his Atlantis dialogues, you know, yeah. read the critiques, read the Timaeus. What or, is, or a discussion on the cave. Uh, yeah, or a discussion on the cave. Young, young people take that very yeah. easy, I think. Yeah, exactly. What, what is he getting at here? And so philosophy, I think, needs to be restored. Literature is another area I, I'm absolutely insistent needs to be beefed up because like music, literature – teaches you how and poetry incidentally i would i'd put front and center here mm. because it teaches you how to read a text it teaches you how to analyze a text connect dots and this is this is an art that is I, I hate to say it, almost completely lost. Well, well, you, no, no. Uh, I, I say, even though it may not be your or my taste, it has found some kind of organic survival in the uh, so-called hip-hop scene, actually. Yeah, in a certain sense. They do have a poetry slams, and it's a modernistic expression, but it's, it's a kind of a free expression because you don't have it in the school anymore, so it pops right. up in popular culture. Because poetry... Well, I think you're going to see more of that. I, I really do. Yeah, yeah, because my, my point is that poetry, as well as music and, and, and art and other things, are so inherent in us that yes. even if you erase it from the educational system, it has to pop up in the well, free I think society. I think you're going to see I think you're going to see it pop up for yet another reason. Catherine Fitz and I just uh, finished her year end wrap up interview. Mm -hmm. And we discussed we discussed these types of issues at some length. One of the things that we're facing in this country, particularly now with, with the incoming Trump administration and trying to reshore jobs, the, the plain fact of the matter is over the long term, and I'm sure he knows this, but the problem is over the long term, we're going to see more and more robotic displacement of actual human jobs. Okay, mm -hmm. I went into a big chain retail a uh, company here a couple of weeks ago to buy a few things. And I, and I have to say, I don't like shopping at this company at all, mm -hmm. but I went in there late at night and they had the, the self checkout lanes, about nine of them. They had no human cashier there other than the supervisor for those nine lanes, trying to coordinate everybody checking out all at once on the self serve lane. So in other words, they'd completely stripped their overnight cashier staff all right. Can people just walk out with the no. items? No, they can't. They still have to check out because they still have still got those things at the door. They have the security guards at the door. So yeah, yeah they they replaced the uh, workers with security guards, of course. Yeah, they they mm. replaced they replaced nine cashiers with one cashier managing the self checkout and a security guard. Mm -hmm. So they cut staff. This is going to be an increasing trend, but. What I think is going to happen as a result of this is as there is more and more leisure time simply being forced on people, they're going to turn to artistic expression mm. by the nature of the case. And as a result of that, you're going to see that intangible thing that economists call human productivity rise. Mm. And that's human productivity is not the same thing as labor productivity. Labor productivity is 
you know, the people assembling the cars and in the plants and going out and digging the coal out of the ground or digging the oil well or running the trucks that run back and forth across the country and so on. That's labor productivity. Mm. Human productivity is the soft productivity, the the artists, the 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 authors, the composers, you know, mm. that are going out and doing creative things that are productive and, and monetized, but in a very different way. So I think we're going to see, just by the nature of the case, I think we're going to see an explosion of that mm. for that reason. And I think we're going to see an explosion of it for another reason in that I've said this many times. We are now in one of those basically 500-year cycles where the paradigm shifts dramatically. Uh, our last cycle was, of course, the, the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation. And, of course, out of that period, you had a tremendous creativity and explosion, not only in the arts, but in philosophy and literature and so on. Mm. I think we're going into a similar period. And because of that, it's going to be, as everybody's kind of shifting and feeling out what what the new paradigm is going to be, both politically and, and financially and economically, you're going to see another explosion of of philosophical reflection and the arts as as a result of it hmm. so i'm i'm cautiously optimistic in this respect um but again i want to emphasize caution but yeah as far as education goes al we we really need in this country particularly uh much less so in europe if it still resembles what i remember from from my experience at oxford um, EK to some degree, but like we, I said yeah. before, America is the head of the pack, and what happens there eventually comes here. Right. So, I, I read with dismay of European universities uh, adopting some of these American techniques and philosophy because they're going to regret it. But you are getting to a point. <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm getting to the point that America really needs to restore the idea of primary texts in its education. Yeah. Uh, a textbook is, in the American sense, is not a book of texts anymore. It's something, it's a secondary source, or even in many cases tertiary sources, published on, a, on an annual basis by, by these big education companies. This is how they make their money. Mm. So obviously they're not going to make much money publishing uh, a text of, of medieval philosophical no. texts. You know, and that's what I used when I taught medieval philosophy. I had a textbook, and some of my students opened it up and were horrified. They were having to read Aquinas and Avicenna and Lombard and mm. you know, all these people. Uh, and I told them, I said, this is a real textbook. It's a book full of texts. This is exactly the way that you would have been educated, not only in the Middle Ages, but to a great extent in, in Europe up until the modern time. Mm. Uh, you're, you're actually reading Plato, not something that somebody says about Plato. You're actually reading Einstein, not something that somebody says about Einstein, and so on and so forth. And it's not just any somebody. It's somebody who has the approved opinion meant exactly. to, <laughs> meant to exactly. support the system. Right, exactly. Exactly. But 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 I can infer then from what you're saying, and it makes sense because um, everything's connected to everything. I can infer then that <clears throat> if we observe today, we see that wars are now uh, running in order to serve the war industry. That's the only yes. reason we see yes. that we see that health system exists to serve the health companies, uh, the yes. sickness companies, as you call them. Yes, and it's the same thing here. Uh, the education is no longer there to serve the individuals who are supposed to benefit from it, but right. to serve the corporate interest within the education system. Right. 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 Mm. And this is this is true everywhere. You know, Oxford and Cambridge in the United Kingdom attained their position and status simply because they were universities that were set up largely to serve the public good. And ultimately, that meant, you know, serve the interests of the British Empire. Mm. But there was there was a transition that began to occur in Western Europe and in the United States, Canada and so on after World War Two. When the big institutions become increasingly corporatized, and therefore they, they become representative now, as you say, of, of private corporate interests rather than the public good. Mm. And the result is what we see. It's chaos. It, it's not working. So even the fundamental philosophy of, of why do we have these universities in the first place? And 
what did they do that made them work? Well, I again, I go back to the to the origin of our modern universities, which was, believe it or not, the Middle Ages and the church. Well, what what did you do in those medieval universities? You had your texts, and you had the tradition of the advocatus diaboli, the the devil's advocate. Yeah. You you were required to take opposing positions, yeah. you know, even to the church, and debate things and prove your points. <laughs> my, my teacher implemented that in uh, what you call, I think, primary school. Is that what you call it when you're very young? Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. That was fun because you you you're forced to think outside the box. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. And this is a tradition that is all but lost in the American university right now. They they they've become bastions to maintain the narratives of orthodoxy, whatever that orthodoxy may be, science or literary criticism or what have you. Yeah. Uh, and you're not permitted to challenge those orthodoxies uh, on pain of lower grades and, and lost scholarships or lost grants if you're a faculty and so on and so forth. So this is the exact opposite of a university. It's reflected in the common culture too. You see now yes. people are not uh, – Pe people are con uh, want to be right. They don't want truth. They want to be right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. This is all but stifled. And you can see it in the results of this last election and even during the election campaign. Everybody wants to be right, but they don't, they don't want a philosophical discussion of what's true. Mm. And if they're confronted with the truth, then they run off and demand their safe spaces, you know. <laughs> it's just – It's insane. It's just, it is. It's uh, nutty. It's nutty. Uh, and and, and uh, I, I will get back to Trump later, but the fact that sure. he won has made the corporate media just implode. Oh, they're ballistic. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And they are the one, ironically, the one who actually <laughs> crowned him. Without them, he wouldn't stand a chance. Well, they did that, and Trump was – he was very clever. He used the social media mm. to an extraordinary – and he still is. You know, this oh, is what oh, I, And he used the mainstream media. He got oh, yeah. much more time than the others. He knows how to use oh, them. Yeah. So, Oh, yeah. He played them like Nero's fiddle. I mean – Yeah, he did. <laughs> and it serves them right. And it serves them right. You know? <laughs> but back to education. I'll have sure. a question for you regarding that. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, now, if Trump appointed you – Minister of mm -hmm. what you call it, Secretary of Education. Secretary of Education, right? Yeah, yeah. What would you do? Uh, I'd abolish the Federal Department of Education. <laughs> but for, before I, you do that, you have to implement some good <laughs> stuff, right? <laughs> no, I don't even have. Well, that's that's the good stuff I'd implement. I'd okay. just get rid of it right away. But the other thing I would do before I did that mm -hmm. is I would absolutely abolish the idea that. Teachers have to be certified in something called education, okay? Hmm. And I'll tell you what this means. In the United States, and as we pointed out in the Common Core book, what teacher certification arises from is the progressivist theorists back in the late 19th century, continuing all the way up uh, through the world wars and then implementing these ideas in, in force majeure, quite literally, after World War II, when you had uh, the president of Harvard University, uh, James Bryant Conant, and then uh, Henry Chauncey at the Educational Testing Service, people like this, it was Wilhelm Wundt. It was a, a German psychologist in, in Prussia <laughs> you know, that's, that's exercising all of this influence over America. What time are we talking about here? Uh, it would be about 1880. It would be after the founding of the German Empire. Oh, it's about that eight... old. Wow. Yeah, it is. Wow. It is. And why would America be adopting a Prussian model yeah. for, you know, for education, the, the idolization and glorification of the state, yeah. and do that without adapting the German standards of, of academic requirements? You know? <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Yeah. So it's just crazy. But, but they, they, what Wundt did is he trained a lot of these progressive educators in America. And with this, the, em the emphasis in education shifted. You see this particularly in people like Thorndike and John Dewey and all of these so-called philosophers of educational theory. Mm. The emphasis shifted from knowing content and be a being able to think critically to socializing the child. In other words, preparing him for a life of a good worker bee. Mm. 
in in the new consumer society that they were putting into place. All right. Mm. So in other words, they didn't want people that could think critically. They wanted people that could accept a narrative and their role in it. All right. Mm. Now, that's number one. But what happened to the teachers as a result of this is they became kind of the equivalent of a paralegal. You know what a paralegal is? No. Do you have those in Europe? All right. A paralegal in this yeah, Probably, but I don't know the word. Um, we probably have a, another word for it in Norwegian. Okay. Well, a, a paralegal in this country is someone that is like a law clerk in a law firm. They're not a practicing lawyer. They're right. not members. They're not members of the bar, but they're the ones that actually go and pull the legal books off the shelves and look up case precedent and put together the legal briefs for the lawyers. All right. Right. So in other words, they have a limited license to practice. Yeah, they're like a, a lawyer's assistant. A lawyer's assistant. They've got a limit. And please note my words here. They've got a limited license to practice. Mm. The same thing has happened in this country in nursing. There are in this country what are called nurse practitioners. And a nurse practitioner has a limited license to practice medicine. In other words, he or she can actually write prescriptions in a limited number of cases. They can administer drugs. And they even do, in some states, they even do a limited minimal amount of outpatient surgery. So in other words, they're not wow. even a doctor but they have a limited license to practice. This is what happened in education. Teacher certification is a limited license to practice educational psychology. Mm. Follow me? Mm. So in other words, the emphasis in, a, in an American teaching school is not on the content of the discipline that you're supposed to teach. It's on the methodology of how you're supposed to teach it. Mm. So the focus in American education, because of this teach, nutty teaching certification requirement, is that you now have teachers that know more about educational psychology and the latest trendy fad mm. in how to teach and know little about what to teach. Okay? Right. As a result of this, Al, I have, as you know, I have a PhD from the oldest university in the English-speaking world. Mm. I could step in front of a high school classroom and teach American history or European history, even Russian history. I could teach ancient history. I could teach philosophy. I could science. even teach you, you know, I could mm. give you a good course in the history of the philosophy of science. And on and on we go, simply because of, of the subject matter that I studied. And, and you do. You do it here. You do it on your yeah, own, I, I own do website. It on the, mm. Yeah, but the problem is I cannot teach in a public school system with that degree. Mm. I have to go out and get a special teaching certificate that licenses me in all the latest methodological claptrap. And if you've ever sat through one of those classes, you will be appalled at not only the level of idiocy of it, but at the passive-aggressive techniques that are used and peddled under the guise of educational theory in how to teach. Mm. It's, it's nothing but a study of passive aggression. Mm. So this is the problem and the result is dumbing down and the result is dumbing down it's just nuts it's totally nuts so i'd get rid of teacher certification then i'd get rid of the federal department of education and and try and get a federal law passed that that recognizes the rights of local school boards teachers and parents to to uh set the agenda for the requirements that are there locally mm. Because Sioux Falls, South Dakota is not the same thing as San Diego, California, yeah. or Bergen, Norway, or Vienna. Yeah, so, so not just individual approaches for students, but also the context, the place, the culture, the, yes. the yeah. circumstances. Exactly. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, this one-size-fits-all model isn't working. No. It isn't working. No. And there's recognition of this fact even in the Middle Ages. You have universities in Bologna and Padua and Paris and Heidelberg. Well, why are they popping up all over and why are there slight variations between all of them? Mm. It's because there was the recognition that it's going to be a little different from place mm. to place. Obviously. <laughs> Obviously. I mean, it's very natural when you think about sure. it. Mm. Sure. But I wonder then. And I guess it's just speculation, um, but I want your take on it. Mm -hmm. the, it's about the chicken and the egg. Right. Because is this, uh, 
Is this a complete uh, collapse? Is that a result? Or, I mean, is the dumbing down mm -hmm. going on? Mm -hmm. Is that the result of how things have developed? Or is it the cause? I mean, is it intentional? Oh, I think a lot of it is intentional. This is something we tried to bring out in the Common Core book. Um, James Bryant Conant at Harvard and, and his acolyte, uh, Henry Chauncey, at, that founded the Educational Testing Service, which administers the, the SAT test in this country, part of it was intentional they, because they had the deliberate desire to create a standardized method of sorting through America's public school population. Yeah and picking and selecting the best and the brightest to go on for Harvard scholarships and so on and so forth. Mm. Uh, and there were proposals back in the 1930s as during the Depression, American high schools took in a huge amount of unemployed teenagers. So this was, this was also part of it. It was partly an effect of the Depression taking in people that normally would not have been in public school. The effort here, in other words, was a huge effort of social engineering. Mm. <laughs> But as we point out in the book, the problem with the standardized test is that it in turn punishes the finer mind. Mm. You know, and we give examples of, of test questions from the 1960s that were just egregiously wrong. What the educational testing service wanted was a wrong answer. We point out a book by a, an acquaintance of, of Albert Einstein by the name of Banish Hoffman, an old American mathematician that had been trained in Europe, come over to this country during the war. And Hoffman just absolutely was brilliant and ruthless with the standardized test questions because he pointed out the example of a national merit scholarship test where there were words, four words, one of which was supposed to be misspelled, which you had to select the misspelled word. Well, the word that was misspelled was intentionally, mm -hmm. and it was spelled with an S-I-O-N-A-L-L-Y rather than a T-I-O-N-A-L-L-Y. But the student who took the test, remember, this is for a national merit scholarship. So in other words, the test is designed to do exactly what James Bryant Conant wanted, And that was to find the brilliant people to pass them on to brilliant universities like Harvard, mm -hmm. recent home to a center for Sharia law, thanks to Saudi money, <laughs> to, to pass them along to Harvard for their merit scholarships. Well, the kid that took this test noted that the word intentionally had a special, in its misspelled form, had a special technical usage and had been deliberately misspelled by the famous American logician philosopher Hayakawa, okay? Mm -hmm. So in other words, it had a technical usage in its quote-unquote misspelled form, and of course, the educational testing services experts didn't know this. Mm. So the educational testing service counted him wrong on his exam, when in fact, he knew more than they did <laughs> And they should have rewarded him. Yeah. So in other words, the standardized test question will not allow you to explain your answer or reasoning. You simply have to guess what's in the mind of the idiot test makers to begin with. Mm -hmm. And that's that, again, is dumbing down rather than elevating people. Mm. So I'm all for getting rid of, you know, this is the other thing I'd do if I were Secretary of Education. I'd, I'd just get rid of standardized tests mm. and go back to the old method of essay tests that are evaluated by the people that the students themselves are in day-to-day -day contact with, rather than make them guess what's in the minds of a bunch of anonymous committees on the East Coast Of, of graduates from mediocre American higher educational institutions. Mm. This, this whole but, but thing... Wouldn't you, be, wouldn't you be in the mercy of a good or a bad teacher? Sure, of course you would. Of course you would. But do you think that, that all of this system has changed that now? No. no, no. What it's done is it's amplified the effect of the bad teacher after all. Mm. If you can have a student like this responding to a question like that that knows more than the actual test makers, what you've just done is you've put badly educated test makers 
in a position where they're responsible at a national level. So you've multiplied the effect of the bad teacher to a national scale mm. rather than confined it locally. So in other words, I think the decentralization impulse here actually helps you in the long term rather than harms you because eventually you're going to come in contact with people that know more information that will be able to correct the influence of the bad teacher. And eventually, yep. you know, I'm, I'm a libertarian here. Eventually the market is going to force out those bad teachers rather than re <coughs> pardon me, reward them with a permanent position in an educational establishment that cannot fire you. Mm. Teachers and teachers in, in local schools anymore are kind of like federal bureaucrats. They just won't go away. They're just like a bad rash. So, you know, um, mm. this is the other problem. The system des is designed now to reward not only stupidity, but just plain sloth. Mm. So this is the other thing that needs to go. The whole system, the whole system needs to be scrapped. Totally. So, so even as a teacher yourself, you think that um, it's okay if we were, uh, if it were easier to get rid of uh, teachers. It would be easier to get rid of teachers if it were local. In other words, mm. if if you knew, if you were a local school board superintendent or a parents committee or something in mm. your locality in Christiansand rather than having to answer to, big, to a big bureaucracy in Oslo, sure, you could get rid of that teacher much easier without having to jump through all the bureaucratic hoops that Oslo is going to lay down. Well, it's the same thing here. You cannot get rid of these tenured teachers. And again, I have horror stories from people in the teaching profession uh, that tell me what they have to put up with with other teachers. Actually, I think that tenured professors, full professors, should be protected. Right. If uh, you start, but, but I guess if you reach all the way up to the top, you can't, I mean, a certain kind of uh, ability you have to have because otherwise they would get rid of all the professors who were critical because you have a freedom as a pro full professor right. to research whatever you want right. and to talk like Robert Chuck, we just had him on. They would get rid of him long ago heartbeat, because yes, of his. Because of, you know why? So well, I agree. Yeah. I agree that there has to be a system of tenure of some sort, and mm. even at the elementary school level. But the problem is, is that tenure is a reward for yeah. expertise in your field or competence in the classroom or both competence yes yes you know not but incompetence but competence not incompetence mm. the problem has been is that you get tenure in so many cases by adhering to a narrative and once once tenure is rewarded in many cases people just quit producing uh, there's too many cases of professors assigning their teaching assistant to go teach the class so that they can go off and write their papers yeah and, you know, the professor's job is to profess a discipline, not publish papers. No, I know in America, they leave all that to the adjunct professors. Right, exactly, mm. exactly. So the system is broken even on that level. The, the system does not resemble what the tenure system was really set up to do. And that is precisely to protect, as you put it, and I think you're correct, to protect the professor who has views at odds with the standard narrative of the discipline. Robert Schock would certainly be questioned. There's an American uh, biologist at Harvard that uh, has come out with some pretty potent critiques of, of the theory of evolution. It's not that he disbelieves it, but you know he's got some pretty hefty critiques of it. Mm. And again, if he were not tenured, you know exactly what would happen to him when, when the evolution priesthood comes in mm. to maintain their dogma. So, you know, and the same thing in, is going on in physics. You see in American universities the, the pushing of string theory, and there are other theories out there, loop quantum gravity. Climate change, you name it. Any controversial it. Yeah, uh, exactly. subject, they will get rid of all critical voices. Right, right. Exactly. Uh, even, even though it's it's based upon research, one thing is opinions. Right. But even even researching, look, I, I I found something here. It questions the official paradigm. Right. 
Right, right. Oh, instead of <laughs> instead of questioning the paradigm, <laughs> let's get rid of this person. Let's get rid of this yeah, person. Yeah, exactly. Nuisance. Rather than rather than fulfill our function as a university is supposed to be, mm. again going back to the idea of the advocatus diaboli from the Middle Ages that sets this system up. Mm. What they've done is is they've turned universities into churches. Yeah, they've turned them into churches, into bastions of maintaining an orthodox narrative be it in physics or what have you, mm. uh, this is not what they're for. No. You know, and it's the reverse. If you study religion, perish the thought that you maintain any sort of traditional religious doctrine in an American school. <laughs> you get everything but and and no opportunity. Yeah. So everything That's is just, you know, everything is just nuts. <laughs> it's yeah. just nuts. Well, um we we're gonna have a serious and this compilation we're gonna make we are making here with you on education. We're gonna have a serious uh, I think we call it the crisis of academia. Yeah, and we're going to interview different people, like um, say Rupert Sheldrake. Uh, we're going to have, oh, yeah, yeah good, and we're going to have choice. back, yeah. And we, what did you say? <laughs> good choice. Yeah, and we're going to have back Michael Cremer. I, I want him to share his experience with, yeah, um, yep. uh, what he ex. So, so we're going to shed light on the corruption yeah. in academia. Good idea. It needs to be done. And, and it begins very early, like you pointed out in this in these, uh, this series of questions we've had with you on that. So, yeah. Right. By the way, I have a different people who helps me with this webcast, and our man, Blue Green, the guy who does the videos, he mm -hmm. he's a big fan of you too. And he wanted us to buy access to your website, uh, Giza Death Star. Mm -hmm. which we did recently. And when I peeked in there, because I, honestly, I have to admit that last time when you told me the price to, to become a member, I was thinking that's, that's a bit expensive, isn't it? But on the other hand, you know, you, we get to support you. You get something back. It's not just um, donation. So, okay. Right. But then when I started to explore your website, I realized that this isn't just a website or a community, even if you're aware of it or not, what you're actually putting up there is it's some kind of online school you've got going. Yeah, it, it is in a certain sense. Yeah, it's, it's a very conversational place. Uh, the most enjoyable aspect of it for me anyway is is you know it's my social life doing those vid chats <laughs> with people and, and just talking with people it's it's just one big long conversation really with people all over the world um yeah. we've got members in estonia and poland and germany and sweden and hungary and norway and the netherlands belgium france italy uh australia australia yeah new zealand uh china all yeah. <laughs> yeah all wow. over the place so it's very interesting uh, because you get uh, you get an interesting pers perspective because people are kind of all thinking the same thing. Um, I'm I'm constantly amazed because what what we do in the vid chats there there's some papers up there when I have time to put them up and there's some webinars when I have time to do those things. But the vid chats are interesting because I ask people to submit questions in writing, and you ought to hear some of the questions and comments. They're very well thought out. But what always kind of stuns me is every now and then, everybody's thinking without any coordination with each other is thinking more or less the same thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And sending you the same kind of theme yeah, uh, yeah, matters, right? Yeah. Mm. And it's not just a conversation. I mean, uh, you're pouring out there. You did used to teach in, in public schools. So right. you're kind of actually doing, although you're an author in addition, you're still doing your professorial duty here, just switching it online. Yeah, in a certain sense, I guess I am. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Although without my professorial persona, I had, I had a kind of... <laughs> I had a kind of crusty uh, sort of approach to being a professor. It was no nonsense. You know, I was, um, well, the students nicknamed me Dr. Armageddon. <laughs> <laughs> so geese a death star is yeah. pretty properly named. It's very appropriate because <laughs> my tests were sort of notorious <laughs> around. How? You were very strict, very hard tests? Uh, I, I never gave multiple choice questions except once. I oh, gave yeah. The famous one with a million answers. With, yes. <laughs> you know, A through Z, picked from 26 <laughs> answers in one question. But, you know, the interesting, the interesting thing, 
people ask me all the time, well, what should I do with my kids? I'd say, you know, send them to Europe, send them to Russia, you know, <laughs> yeah. send, send them to a real university. Yeah. But, and, you know, the other thing I can tell people is you've, and I've said this over and over and over again, each of us now, individually now at this moment is responsible for knowing the, the monuments and outlines of our Western culture. And each of us now is responsible for handing down as much of it as we can mm. that is of value to us personally, because the system is not going to do it. The system is being designed no. precisely to cut you off from all of that. Mm. So, uh, so if you it, want that education, I, I suggest you enroll to the school of Giza Death Star because you, <laughs> you get there's so much knowledge there, and, and not even from you, also oh, yeah. from your your participants. Yeah, the members on the website just kind of constantly astonish me for for the the depth and breadth of their questions. Yeah. Um, it, it, and commentary, quite frankly, it's it's yeah. really an interesting. Um, no, I was so impressed, and I'm thinking that our talk today is is such a it's such a niche, it's such a small uh, subject. I'm thinking that this will not be the record uh, in numbers, but I'm thinking all the people at your website, at least, will get something out of our discussion today. Mm -hmm. So, okay, let's now recap and, uh, you know, to conclude and feel free, free to repeat what you said before, just to get everything together here. So I ask you again, uh -huh. um, if you were the Minister of Education, mm -hmm. or, or you maybe you call it the Secretary of Education, what do you call it? Right, Secretary. Yeah. So uh, what would you do differently? Well, I'd get the federal government out of education altogether. Yeah, states means, matter, right? It, states, or even for that matter, localities. And, cool. and I'm I'm a I'm a staunch kind of states' rights person here. If some states want to go wacky and kooky mm. and teach, you know, seven day creationism, that's up to them because they'll pretty soon find out how far that's going to go. Yeah economically and financially but um get the federal government out altogether number two uh technology is not the answer to everything mm. uh, i do believe that real education is a mentoring process of individuals in contact with individuals in other words the teachers are center in the classroom mm. i would thirdly get rid of all idea of teacher certification this has been the bane of american education mm. Uh, I think that teachers should only be experts in their discipline. No need for all of this psychobabble, psychological theory, lesson planning, and all of the happy horse pucky that goes with it in American education. And all the bureaucracy, right? And all the bureaucracy. Mm. Yeah. We we are being choked to death by doctors of edubabble mm. in this country. And the focus when you when you learn an education degree, which to me is a pseudo discipline, I'll be very blunt. Mm. The focus is all on methodology, psychology, and all, and for a reason that I get into in the book with my co-author, uh, Gary Lawrence, all of this is taking the focus away from the content of the disciplines. And, and all the paperwork instead of teaching. And all the, yeah, all the paperwork instead of teaching and teaching to these ridiculous standardized tests which themselves are problematical. Yeah, um, yeah. For, and again, I get, into, I get into aspects of that in the book as well. But so, if you could choose from the top shelf uh, uh, pedagogical system, which one would you would you choose, or would you let that be also up to you know that kind of different? That's that I, I don't even go to pedagogical method because I'm not mm. concerned with pedagogy. I'm concerned with communicating and teaching a discipline. I'm a, I'm an old professor type of guy. Mm. I believe there's a difference between a professor and a teacher and an educator and that everybody should be exposed to what a professor is at some point in their could, could, could you fill us in on these three terms? A professor, a professor professes a discipline. In other words, they're not there to talk down to you. Mm. They're there to raise you up. Right. And what we have in America is the exact opposite system. We've got a system being choked to death mm. by – talking to the lowest common denominator, being choked to death by ridiculous political correctness. Uh, there's no time for that. Uh, so so if, if a professor is that, what's then a teacher and what was the third, an educator? 
I think a teacher is someone who is there not only to convey a discipline, but to give you the skills to manage that discipline, mm-hmm. give you the skills, give you the skills to keep learning by yourself. Right. Uh, and that to me is what an educator is. By the time you get to college, you should have all those skills in place. Then you get the professors that hit you with the disciplines. Right. In a major way. Um, so, you know, I, I'm totally against just virtually everything that, that modern Western education has become. Um, it, it's not education anymore. It's indoctrination. And But do we see any – is there any glimpse of, of light uh, somewhere in either uh, you see in the American system or abroad? I, I, I see absolutely no glimpse of light in this Jeez. system. Right. Uh, and in uh, abroad, what I fear is happening in Western Europe – and I see this in the UK, particularly with, with Cambridge and Oxford, is they're adopting increasingly Americanized yeah. methods. Yeah. And, and, and folks, for, especially for those in, of you in Europe, Europe is the heart and soul and home of our education system and of our great universities. You do not need to be mimicking America. <laughs> I, I mean, in yeah. any way, for that matter, not just in education, but pretty much across the board right now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, but, but anyway, please not in your education system. No, but know. that's because America is the is the window uh, dressing of the globalists. That's well, yeah, yeah, and look what we're exporting. Look, look at the high culture America's exporting: McDonald's, yeah. Justin Bieber. <laughs> Uh, you know, look at America's great literature. If you can name something that is great American literature in this century, please let me know. America, one of my friends put it this way, America is a great big purgatorial strip mall of a culture. It's a stinking, seeking, <laughs> stinking, sinking garbage barge. Uh, there is no high culture in this country. I, I get so sick of people mentioning um, Justin Bieber and these people in the same breath that they mentioned J.S. Bach. Uh, people mentioning Jackson Pollock in the same breath that they'll mention Rembrandt or Velasquez. This is nuts. Yeah. <laughs> It's just nuts. There's no sense of a hierarchy of, of cultural value or tradition in this country. Mm. It, it has absolutely been gutted, and I think very intentionally, and and through the education system. You know what? So, um, what was his name? Uh, the big. Uh, uh, he was gay. He was a British uh, author in the beginning. Oh, um, Oscar, uh, Wilde, Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde. Yes. You know what Wilde said about America? Oh, I shudder to think. <laughs> but, but, but do tell. <laughs> he said. America is the only country that has gone from barbary to decadency without civilization in, in between. between. <laughs> and I don't agree, listen, actually. But and but listen, he's absolutely right, in my opinion. You know, we may have we may have had a little bit of civilization for a couple of years, you know, around the turn of the century, but. In, from from the revolution <laughs> and up to the turn of the century, there was. Yeah, it's. I cannot tell people how frustrated American teachers are with this system, but none of them is willing to see that their own teacher certification that they had to go through is part of the problem, that this whole edifice of, of so-called education in this country is the problem. Is that why teachers aren't standing up or are they standing up? I don't know. Well, they're trying to stand up. Mm. But even then, many of them have been indoctrinated with this progressivist philosophy to education and still think there's a place for pedagogy and methodology course. I don't. I, I'm sorry. Mm. I don't. Mm. And label me a troglodyte, if you will, but that's where I stand. Um, you know, I, I, I shudder because I see the American system spreading around the world. And I'm thinking, oh, please, yeah, you know, yeah. don't get rid of those traditions at Heidelberg or the Sorbonne or, mm. you know, Cambridge mm. or Oxford. Keep those traditions because th that's real university education. It's uh, this this country is is so messed up with education. It's not funny. Yeah. No, uh, but all, all the more reason for people who want some good learning to, to join your website then and get a very, a very vivid, very, uh, I mentioned to 
Tobias Churton when we had him on mm. that. Um, Jocelyn Godwin, his his colleague in America, he yes, he, uh-huh. uh, he he wrote a very good article that you ought to read, actually, considering your book about American education system, where he talked about there's two types of teachers, basically, it's the Saturnian type yes. and the Hermetic type. Yes, exactly. And his um, his uh, essay is called uh, "Priest Professors and Gurus." Really recommend it. It, it was an eye opener to me. Send me the link. I'll definitely look yeah, at. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's easily available but i look for it and send it but sure. anyway so I, i'm thinking you're at least at the website you're more the hermetic type you're you're kind of people learn by interaction and you have a very vivid writing style too and there's a lot of papers that you have uploaded to the website yes so people get a lot of stuff back from the subscription so i, I just want to put that out there yeah. Yeah. So we probably have uh, more to talk about. Oh, yeah. Please. Right. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> I'll either come on and say we're doomed, pray for this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or, well, I, or there's I a think... little there's a little flicker of hope. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> a flicker of hope will be doomed. <laughs> Pretty much, you well, know, uh, I've never seen anything like this ever. No, and and if we, if we even have an internet after the election. Well, we don't that's know. the other problem. I'm honestly completely fearful what's going to happen to websites like mine or yours or anybody else's. I I genuinely am fearful. Mm. I don't often comment about domestic American politics, but if she gets in, it's over. Yeah. 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 It's it's over. And uh, not only that, but uh, when TISA TTPA comes in, uh, they're they're above the law. Mm -hmm. Then it's corporate Mm -hmm. switch have judges that they have appointed themselves and yep. we can't do shit about it. Well, I think if the TTP agreements come in and all that stuff, I think there's going to be significant pushback in a very short yeah. time. I really do. From who? People. There's already been pushback from India. Yeah. Uh, that I was astonished. The Indian high court overturned a corporate suit for copyright violation because some school had copied it, you know, handed out photocopies of a textbook. Wow. And India said, nah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. <laughs> take take your lawsuit and take a hike. You know, it's, yeah. I think there's going to be significant pushback. I really do. Um, yeah, I'll tell you what, if America survives the next years, I may actually move. <laughs> I'll probably be alone. Everybody else has probably escaped. But uh. well, listen. Increasingly, Al, I think education is going to change for the better because enough people are waking up Mm. to the. You know, Catherine Fist just comes right out and tells people, "What should I do for my kids' education?" She tells them, "Don't send them to an American university." You know, school them at home if you can. Send them overseas if you can afford it. Yeah, but again, if you're either rich or bright, that works for you. Right. But if your parents are working three jobs... That doesn't. Uh, right. But what will happen is that they will go out, I think, and do the hard work themselves anyway. Mm. Uh, I really think that it's getting to the point now that all of these fixes from the big corporations and the government are clearly not working uh, we see this – let's put it this way, Al. The, the last election in this country, as I've been saying all along, was a referendum. It was a referendum about several things. Yeah. Uh, it was a referendum about global loanism versus, versus the, the uh, ability to stand up for and defend your culture, which is not a mm. crime. It's amazing to me that Vladimir Putin in his last Christmas address last year – came right out and and stated this defending our culture is not a crime Mm. and he just kind of put it that bluntly you know which was music to my ears that someone would actually say this we don't need to be ashamed of western culture Mm. the other thing that it was a referendum on was obviously the nuttiness and agenda of the american corporate controlled media that really just shot itself in its foot. They, they've so lost their trust. But because it was a, a referendum on the American corporate media, it, by implication, and this has not yet hit in this country, but it will, it was also a referendum on American education. Mm. 
And when people wake up and realize that, as I'm confident they will, but it will be a slow process, but I'm confident that they'll wake up and realize, hey, the same thing that the media was doing is what we see going on in our schools. Mm. Once they realize that, then you're going to see the other shoe drop and you're going to see, I think, an explosion of people educating themselves and for those that can afford it, hiring tutors. And I've told, I've had people ask me very bluntly that have enough money to tutor their kids. I said, well, if you want tutors, the first thing to look for is if a person has ED in their degree. In other words, if a person is telling you, yeah, I went to an education school and learned the latest methodology, don't hire them. <laughs> yeah. That would become, uh, instead of an advantage, a disadvantage. It will yeah. become a disadvantage, exactly. But uh, don't, not to worry, because uh, one huge advantage that uh, youths have today that yeah. they didn't have back in the day is the internet. Yes, absolutely. That democratizes uh, the ability to explore and learn and interact and whatever. Yeah, it, it can be a good thing if used in the right way. Um mm. The tendency. Yeah, that's a problem. Yeah, I see what you mean. It, it can also, it's a two edged sword of that. Yeah, thing. it is. It is. Mm. It, it really is. Um, American, American school kids have the idea that everything's on the internet. And this is why. Or even worse, uh, they can get all answers from Wikipedia. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and this, of course, is simply not true. And, uh, you know, I know teachers that make a point of designing classes on trying to find information that they cannot find on the internet, that they have to go mm. to a book because the book oh, has... That's a good exercise. Yeah, it, yeah, it's a very good exercise. Or perish the thought, go to a library and learn how to use a card catalog. You know? mm. <laughs> so uh, there's there's all sorts of stuff. And, you know, if you just look at, at my own books, most of what are, is in my books is not available on the internet. Mm. I have to go out and buy the physical books and, and do the research or, or ask a friend to go to a library and uh, photocopy something for me at a university library and so on and so forth because it simply is not there on the internet. You cannot find that. You know, the internet is is a good tool for information flow, but we always need to remember that it's the invention of DARPA. The, the Defense mm. Advanced Research Projects Agency. So it's also an information filter. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Wikipedia. And, and a surveillance tool. Oh, yeah, Wikipedia. You, you, know, you mentioned Wikipedia. Wikipedia, I used to have a biography up on Wikipedia. They took it down because they were claiming I didn't actually go to Oxford. <laughs> you know, I know, it's, it's insane. It, you, we all know who controls Wikipedia. Oh, yeah. I have in a family a uh, professor in geology, mm -hmm. and he has researched, uh, obviously, geologists. They have it right in their face, the evidence in stone. Right. And so he had to be critical about uh, anthropogenic explanations for climate change because right. Uh, right. he had evidence, like, like many others, he's not alone. I mean, it's thousands and thousands, even though they try to push the narrative that it's like 97 seven percent consensus which is bullshit right but but nonetheless um his he was then attacked by people but uh, academics who aren't even in the field of climate <laughs> yeah. climate change and they claimed that oh he had no uh what's it called uh, when you are published in the uh peer review uh, and in it write journals etc right right so they say oh they try to diminish him oh no no he hasn't uh, like, like he's just some cook sitting in a basement, nobody's listening to him. And he's, oh, got this publishing, this publishing, this publishing. Then they blocked him from Wikipedia. Yeah. So he can't even control his own, just like you. He yeah. can't even control his own biography. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and lies about him. And lies about him. Has yes. to be, uh, is allowed to be there. Yeah. To diminish. Same thing. You know, it's the same mm. thing that has happened to me. And, and you know, you yeah. pick, you pick the subject of climate change. Well, yeah, there's there's gobs of geological evidence that this is not simply a, a human... Uh, and solar evidence. And too, solar though. evidence, yes, mm. precisely. So, you know, the other problem that education has now issued in is that peer review itself has been corrupted. Because yeah. what peer review now means is you publish in journals that basically maintain the the standard narrative and yep censorship yeah for dissenting views you have to go elsewhere and those of course are not recognized by the infallible magisterium and mm. 
you know, I'm putting it's it, become a Vatican. It's become a Vatican. Yes, I, I see that in in discussions. People, when they're empty of arguments, yes, they resort to the consensus arguments on authority. You know, or uh, yeah. who's who's authorized? Right. Who does the priesthood of science accept? Right. That's the last stand. Yeah. Yeah. And you can't go go past it because they put value in it. Yeah, exactly. And it's it's the old argument from authority. You know, I had a comment. Mm. I did a news and views the other day, and I had a comment from someone in the chat room as I was doing my news and views. You know, what is this theologian doing offering opinions about physics? Well, you know, <laughs> physicists offer opinions about theology all the time. Yeah, all know? the time. <laughs> so you know, good point. Tit for tat here, guy. You know, this is not this is not. I may be wrong, and I always tell people I'm not a scientist. This is my speculation. You know, there's a 90% chance I'm wrong here. But that doesn't mean I don't have the right to offer an opinion, wrong or right. This is what academic mm. freedom is. It's the right to be wrong. Mm. And that's what mm. real scientific research is. It's the right yeah. to be wrong. Trial and uh, uh, Trial uh, and uh, error. Uh, mm. And to have these arguments from authority, particularly in the name of science, <laughs> to me, it's, it's, you know, this is just this is a sure ticket to a dead end, folks. <laughs> Plato is rotating in his grave. Yeah, if you if you want to halt human scientific progress, this is the way to do it. Mm. You know, so it's just become nutty. And yeah. all of this, Al, goes back to education. Imagine if we started teaching our children. The basics of philosophy, the basics of logic, the basics of rational analysis, be it of a text or a scientific experiment or a piece of music or whatever. If we went back to these fundamentals, imagine within a generation, this whole culture would turn completely mm. and get back on the right course. That's all it would mm. take. Yeah, I think you put your finger on it when you said uh, the trivium and the uh, Quadrivium. I, th I think uh, yeah. we we need to go back to. I mean, even the ancients understood this. Yeah, yeah. We pointed out in in our Common Core book, Al, at the very beginning of the book, we just listed a whole lot of names, and they weren't in any particular order. There was no particular group that was featured. We had a list consisting of Albert Einstein and Fanny Mendelssohn, Marie Curie. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, you know, everybody, mm -hmm. Aquinas, Plato. And we pointed out that none of these people had ever been to an American public school. <laughs> they had never been taught by teachers required to get a teaching certificate. And they had never taken an American standardized computer test. Mm -hmm. And they were brilliant people. And I, and I think that explains it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> that explains it right there. Yeah. We don't need this yeah. system. Well, that's uh, spoken like a true dissident, uh, Joss. <laughs> so, listen, I, I I applied to a seminary, a Lutheran seminary in this country. Mm -hmm. I won't mention which one, and I actually got a letter back from the dean of this seminary, and he addressed me on their letterhead, and he began by saying. Dear Dr. Farrell, I'm taking a tremendous risk writing you this letter on our letterhead. But due to federal hiring guidelines, and I knew when I read those words what had just happened, mm. he went on to tell me I, that I had all the exact credentials. I had done exactly the kind of work that they were looking for to, to cover patristics in, in the Lutheran seminary. Mm. But they had to give the post to a federally approved minority lady who hadn't finished her dissertation yet because of federal hiring guidelines. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I thought, I'm not federally approved. It doesn't matter how good I am in my field. Mm -hmm. It's it, about exterior it, criteria. It's about, it's about exterior criteria. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Be it be it dressing up and, and going through the motions that we're going to do something in the classroom that actually makes sense. None of it works mm. in this country. You know, Catherine and I talked a few weeks ago when she was through here, and one of her com her classic complaints is nothing works. Mm. Nothing works. And that is exactly what's going on in this country. Nothing works. And that's by design. And that's by design. Mm. Yeah. Is it simply uh, that if we keep people busy, overworked, low educated, etc., yep. they're not on to us? Yep, exactly, exactly. Mm. 
I mean, when you read the Common Core book, when you read the history of how this educational system came about, you'll understand exactly that mm. number one is the creation of an elite mm. for, you know, remember Rockefeller saying he didn't want people to be able to think he wanted workers. Yeah. And Borman said exactly the same thing. And Borman said exactly the same thing. Mm. And so did Joseph Goebbels. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll just uh, conclude this uh, portion and we're saying, hey. Teach us, leave our kids alone. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Quoting the wall, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't have done a better job, that's right. <laughs> or hand them over to the professors. <laughs> <laughs> <That's right. laughs> okay. Or at least to Pink Floyd. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. That was the old days. Anyway, Joseph, thanks for coming on today. Yeah, thanks for having me back, Al. Yeah. And um, thanks, thanks a lot for your inputs uh, in this series. Sure. Okay, later, man. All right, take it easy. Yeah. Thank you for listening to Forum Borealis. A brief reminder to our sponsors. Remember that you can sign up at our website to get access to more shows than what is already released. But if you so do, it's prudent to send us a notification so we can open the door, lest you may have to wait weeks, if not months, before getting the admission approved. And now, a few topical quotes to round off this program. It is the supreme art of the teacher to awaken joy in creative expression and knowledge. Education is what remains after one has forgotten everything learned in school, said Albert Einstein. To truly know the world, look deeply within your own being. To truly know yourself, take a real interest in the world. Our highest endeavor must be to develop free human beings who are able of themselves to impart purpose and direction to their lives, the need for imagination, a sense of truth and a feeling of responsibility. These three forces are the very nerve of education, said Rudolf Steiner, founder of the Waldorf Schools. It is true that we cannot make a genius. We can only give to teach children the chance to fulfill their potential possibilities. We discovered that education is not something which the teacher does, but that it is a natural process which develops spontaneously in the human being, said Maria Montessori, founder of the Montessori Schools. The mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be kindled, said Plutarch. Teachers open the door, but you must enter by yourself, is an old Chinese proverb. Thus far for today, we will soon open another door to a different matter, so stay tuned. Your host has been Al. With the help of the Borealis team, you have our sincere regards. Be seeing you. Number one.